Hey guys, it's Adam from Tested, and if you watched my TED talk last year or have heard me speak for any longer than 30 minutes, you know that I'm obsessed with the movie Excalibur. When I was 14, my father took me to see John Borman's Excalibur, and it started a lifelong obsession with armor, particularly the design of the armor in that movie, which turns out to have been designed by master armor Terry English. And where am I standing right now? I'm in the rolling hills of Cornwall, England, standing on the property of none other than Master Armor Terry English, who's going to take me under his wing this week, and together I will help him make me a suit of my dream armor from Excalibur. I can barely wait! Hello, sir, Terry. Adam. Such a pleasure to meet you. A pleasure to meet you. Ah, I am such a fan of your work. Uh, that's really weird because um, I've, that's what I've understood. You're a bit of a fan mm -hmm. of my stuff, Excalibur. And all that stuff. But the funny thing is, I'm quite a fan of yours. <laughs> Music <laughs> to my I've ears. I've watched your program and thought, well, what fun these guys have. You know? Really? Yeah. Oh. In other words, admire you a lot. Amazing. <laughs> shall we? So, shall we discuss some armor? Why don't we do that? Excellent. Yeah. Okay, come yeah. in, please. Right. Welcome to the uh, oh. Anne Garrett Museum. You and I like to fill our spaces with a similar yeah, amount just of... a bit. Whoa! Yeah. Ah, yeah. Who is this? That's um, the elf house armour that I made for Harry Potter film. Oh my gosh. I made that and a 10 foot high troll, which I think is the biggest armour ever made. Oh. Sadly, the scene was cut, but um, you do see the troll armour yeah. in the last film when it pans through a store. And they're both on display at the uh, Harry Potter Museum. So much to look at. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like that, yeah. So you're here to discuss a suit of armor. Yes, I want to talk about armor in gen all things armor. Let's talk about all things armor. Okay, let's all go right. and have a sit down. So Terry, this is is this correct? This is your very first suit of armor you ever built. Yeah. How how old were you when you made this? I was sixteen. Oh. Um, and I finally got a job because I wanted to be a commercial artist when I was at school. Eventually I was actually, I did that. Um, but I got this job at a theatrical costumer, it's called Ellen H. Nathans. They're one of the oldest established costumers at that yeah, time. Yeah, they're super, they're still yeah. super famous. Well, they're now Burmans. Right, I actually right. worked for both of them. But um, I had this little copper leg that really fascinated me, a little miniature leg that I found in a drawer. And I decided I'd try and copy it and, and finished up making this whole little suit. A little, a miniature armor leg. Yeah, yeah, just a little leg. And I was, I was just fascinated with it. But before that, I think when I was about 10 years old, uh, I remember mum and dad one Christmas took it to a big uh, store called Selfridges. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had these little um, plastic kits of armor. Yeah. And that was when I was 10. And I remember, I've still got them somewhere. And I remember making those. And I think that was kind of triggered off the fascination. But then finding an actual metal leg Right, I right. just wanted to make it. And it was kind of through that that started me off on the road to where I am now, I guess. What was it about finding this little articulated armor leg in the drawer that compelled you? Why, why, what do you think was that? Um, I think it was just the fascination of why it moved. You the know, mechanics. The the, yeah, yeah and, and being armor and liking that. You know, I always loved the films of Ivanhoe and all yeah. that stuff, you know. So I guess it was always in my blood. and. Uh, but to actually hold original armor. But at the, uh, Nathan's, um, with the armory, uh, I was really a theatrical metal worker. We, some of the first films are uh, 351 Fahrenheit, uh, Dr. Chivago, uh, Charge of the Light Brigade. I did yeah. all the 14 principles on that. But that was mainly um, badges, buttons, swords, daggers, shields. Crowns. Theatrical versions of these. Yeah, right. I used to make crowns. I was quite specialized in making crowns with the jewels and stuff. And, and, but they had an old stock of armour that sort of dated back to Victorian times. But they used to produce this stuff uh, for films and theatre. And they were continually being hired out and getting smashed up. And it was through repairing them that I learned to make them. Ah, oh, so and you started kind of out by resuscitating things that yeah. had been dented or broken yeah. or hinges gone. Yeah, but they were theatrical armours. And it was only then that once I started specialising in that, I started to do work for um, antique dealers, collectors at the Tower of London. So you, got, you, got, you started getting work repairing real armor. Exactly. And it's through repairing the real stuff, that's when I really learned how it worked. It's not all riveted together. It's on leathers, it's all different mechanics all together. And it was then when I started to specialize in bespoke, made-to-measure, custom-built armor. 
So how long was it, 16, you make this beautiful, beautiful <laughs> figure. How long was it before you made your first full suit of, of, of armor? Um, that was, when, well, when I left Nathan's, I decided to um, start my own company. In fact, Arthur West, my governor, he said, look, you've got, you, you, you've got to leave here. He said, you're too good. He said, how, how old were you? Uh, then I was about 21, I think. Uh, so you'd been there for through. five or six years? On and off, because yeah. I actually worked in that time as a commercial artist, which I always wanted to do at, at school. Yeah. And when I finally got a job in commercial art, I didn't like it. So I went, <laughs> went back into the armory thing. It's funny how that works. Yeah, yeah. So as a sign writer as well. But if I oddly say that, because it's a combination of the fact that um, being an artist, I went to art school for a, a few years as well. And so I'm an artist, a painter, if you like, a designer. And that's where the skills come in now with the film, especially with the film stuff, is that I'm able to use my artistic skills in designing and drawing stuff. And you know. It's not enough just to build it, you have to be able to communicate to the art director and to the director exactly, what you're yeah. actually going yeah, to make. Yeah, yeah. But it's that combination of skills. My father was a tailor, bespoke tailor. Um, who was a oh, that's so cool. He was, I, a, he was actually a cutter, so he cut the patterns. That's like so, the hardest part from yeah, what I understand. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's kind of, I learned a lot from that. Um, and then being an artist and various other things I've done, when you put it all together, it makes an armor. So <laughs> you, you leave and you're about 21, 22. What, you formed your own company. What was that company doing? Uh, yeah. Um, the very first film I worked on on my own when I formed the company, which was then called um, English Armour Hire. It's now English Arms and Armour. Um, the very first film I worked on was with Vanessa Redgrave and Timothy Dalton huh. on Mary Queen of Scots, and I made their breastplates and helmets for oh, that. Oh, wow. Yeah. And you, you just started, you, you opened up a shingle and started making making. Yeah, it kind of films. just progressed from there. And, and then, I, you know, because like you, you, you never stop learning. Yeah. You're always learning something. And, yeah, it's just a progression. And, you know, where it's going to go now, I don't know. So <laughs> you know. my first exposure to your work was I was uh, 14, 15 years old when Excalibur, John Borman's film about mm. King Arthur, came out. Um, that armor compelled me to a lifetime obsession of all kinds of armor. I actually collect spacesuits, and I think it's also because I love armor. Right. Because these are all ways of protecting ourselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, from my memory, I just, I, I, sorry, not, I mean, my recent memory, I watched Excalibur last year. There's a shocking number of armor, full armor suits in that film. How many suits of armor did you make? Well, it finished up, I made 106 armors for that. Nearly killed me. <laughs> <laughs> how, 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 I'm, I'm getting started, tired just thinking about it. How long did it take to make 106 suits of armor? Well, it, was, it started off when I met John. And like all films, even now, um, yeah, it's a bit like what you do as well. Mm -hmm. You meet the director, you get a feel of what he wants the film to look like. Uh, you read the script, yeah. you go through the script. Um, and then you meet the actors that can actually play the part. And all the time you're doing that, you're building a visual image of what that armor should look like. Right. And uh, it kind of, as I say, you don't, you don't make armor, you build it. It's, it's a creation. Yeah. A bit like sculpture. And you take different aspects of their look, their face, the way they stand, mm -hmm. and, and you put all that together, and I, and I start to get an idea, and then I'll do the sketches of what I feel it should look like. Um, so we haven't met John and done that. They were talking then about 14 principal armors for the film. And I thought, for the yeah. main characters. Yeah. Right. And I thought, great, you know, no problem. And I had uh, three months to do it. And I said, yeah, fine, do it. Um, then they came back a week or so later, or a few days later, and said, well, look, um, a bit wrong on that. Uh, the first half of the film is very dark and primeval and very... And I went, oh, wow, really? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we need another 14 suits for that. I went... Okay, fine. And those are, I mean, just the difference between those is really marked because the, the, the principal characters, their armor is very symmetrical and beautiful, the, but the mm. dark, the darker stuff is asymmetrical, yep. and it's bigger shoulders, it's the yeah. pig face. Well, John said to me, um, kind of sparked it off visually, I said, it's all a building thing, and he said, I want them to look like American footballers ah. with these big shoulders and stuff. How, that, I, I, how accurate do you look to get, I mean, because King Arthur is supposedly from the 6th century, right? But, yeah. I mean, clearly, Borman and you were taking from all sorts of different periods. What was your jumping off point? 
Does he tell you, I like this kind of armor, I don't like that kind of armor? Yeah, kind of. Uh, what we did, because uh, there was a lovely guy, um, Tony Pratt, who was the production designer. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, me, him and John went to the Tower of London, spent an afternoon there looking at original armors with sketch pads and stuff to get various ideas and blah, blah, blah. And it kind of all just progressed from there. You know, me and uh, Tony got together and we did sketches. I've got a bundle of them here, the original um, ones. And, uh, and it, it just kind of happened from that. Uh, but the first half of the film was to be very uh, menacing, powerful. Yeah. I looked at things like stag beetles. Uh, I still do. I look at nature. Right. I look. At, I could look at a twig and see a shape, and that would be a horn. Yeah. Um, I think many artists do things like that. Mm -hmm. Salvador Dali was a prime example. And often when I've done a design and and it's all agreed, and once I start making it, I will look at it and I'll, I'll change it. Yeah. Because I think, no, that'd be better if that did that. So it's very much an organic building thing. And that's what creates the magic, hopefully, about what I do. So in each piece of armor, you're taking a flat sheet of metal and you are hammering it and moving the metal. You are, yeah. you yes. are pushing it mm -hmm. until it describes, it describes the outside of a shape of the body. Uh, yeah. who, who was your mentor in teaching you how to move metal like that? Well, it was two guys that... Um, I more or less everything too, really, and uh, apart from my dear father, of course. Um, but there was Arthur West who, who managed the uh, Nathan's Armoury, mm -hmm. and there was another guy that uh, his name was George Clifton, and he worked for a company called Chas H Fox, who was another costumers, but they were mostly repertory company, and um, he actually made armour, um, a theatrical armour, and it was him that first showed me how to do logs, how to beat stuff. And when you say logs, you mean yeah, actual wooden, tree trunks? Tree trunks, scoops in them, yeah. So you don't use an anvil? No, no very rarely. <laughs> uh, for making horseshoes. <laughs> I don't do horseshoes. <laughs> um, Not often. Um, yeah, but it's um, so George and Arthur, um, were my mentor. I mean, they were just wonderful, wonderful people. Really old school, you know. And, uh, and I just learned so much from them guys. But then when I started getting it really into it, having learned what I learned from them, I just took it so much further. Mm -hmm. And moving metal, you know, it's, it's weird because you can get yourself a flat sheet of metal and you get a hammer and you beat it, or pound it, I think, in America. <laughs> and you beat this metal. And, but often when you do things, start beating it, it's not so much about the stretching of the metal to get it, it's also about shrinking it. Right, it shrink, right. It's right. a shrinking process as well. And it, it depends where you land the hammer, how hard you hit it. And uh, when, when we get into it, you'll notice when I'm using a hammer, you'll hear the difference in the weight of the blows. It can be very hard, yeah. And then softer to, to get. Because there's no um, straight curve in a suit of armor. It's, it's all, all compound, all compound curves. curves, yeah. And that's the way it all moves on each other. So there's no gaps. That's you know, the way it all kind of kind of works. And that's the sort of thing that I had to learn for myself, really. But it was, uh, as I say, really, if it, if it wasn't for repairing those old armors in that company, uh, this probably none of this would have happened. Is that well, you? And so I'm curious about that because when you're making armor for films, you're you because you're a designer, you are drawing from all of your knowledge of history of armor to deliver characters mm. and and personalities in this armor and and, and stories. Mm. Right, you're mm -hmm. helping tell the director's story. But then you also do all this restoration for Tower of London and museums of real pieces of armor mm. from hundreds and hundreds of years ago. When, yeah. when you're touching those pieces of armor, do you feel like you're talking to the original <laughs> maker? That's exactly right. You've got it in one. Um, if I'm working on an original, um, it could be a sword. You know, I, I would pair um, original swords. It you know, might be a branch missing off a rapier or whatever. And I'm able to match them in, but also age it in perfectly as well. So you, you would never ever know it's been done. Right. And that's what kind of happens. Do you um, feel like you can see? You feel like you learn things about the person that originally yeah. hit and set those. Yeah, hammers? because anyway, I'm working with it's a piece of armor or a sword, or whatever really. Um, I, I, I kind of talk, talk to the person that originally made it. Yeah. And I, I say to them, you know, how did this bit go? Am I doing this right? And I actually do that. And I don't know what that means or where that comes from. Or I don't question it. All I know is it happens. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what makes it work. Ah, this tires me just thinking about it. When you made 105 suits of armor for Excalibur, yeah. was that the biggest job you had done up till that point? Um, I think it's probably the biggest job I've done 
since. Um, was there a moment in production when you got to see this a huge crowd of 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 actors wearing your armor? Well, uh, yeah, it's kind of another story there because. Um, because I, t I realised I'd taken on so much and just kept saying yes, not <laughs> appreciating that the time was still... I'm a freelancer, you'd same. always yeah. say yes. <laughs> exactly. And so I had this sort of um, shock went through me. I thought, oh my God, what have I done? And, uh, and then I decided that, because I'd made one suit before, part of a suit for um, some film, I can't remember what it was, Line in Winter, I think it was. Oh, I love Pete, that film. Peter O'Toole, yeah, yeah. yeah. Early films. I did all the daggers and swords and oh. stuff like that. And I did the jousting, there was a little jousting scene, I made the armour for that. And I did it in aluminium for some strange reason. And it kind of worked, and I thought, okay, well. And when and I it's did nice it, and light for the actors. Yeah. So when I did Excalibur, and because of the time factor, I thought, I'll do it in aluminium. And I thought, hmm, yeah, I'll do it. So I made the whole lot in aluminium. And that's what I've been doing ever since. It was, um, A, it's very light to wear. Yeah. It is, it, it, Comparatively easier to make. It's much easier to maintain because that would dent a bit easier. It's all right. much quicker and easier to get them out. Um, but the most important thing is it don't go rusty in the rain. Oh. <laughs> so all 105 suits for Excalibur were all aluminium. Aluminium, sorry. Yeah, but it was funny because um, when I'd made about 60 of them, we moved the whole workshop out to Ireland and finished up making the rest of it actually on location. And we were because of the time factor, we were literally following the script. Uh, when the arms we were being needed, we were literally making them almost the day before. Oh my goodness. It was an absolute nightmare. But we, we did it. And I say we, because I had a team of three guys with me then. That's it, four of you? Yeah. And uh, it was just me and a uh, dear uh, partner at the time. I had Peter, Peter Lyatt, a lovely, lovely guy. We were friends from school kids. And uh, we did all the finishing and most of the work. And the other guys were really cutting out and doing rough beating, polishing, stuff like that. And I'd, by then I'd had about 60 suits made. And John and Tony Pratt and a couple of other people said, uh, could we see some of them all dressed just as a test? Right. And I said, yeah, sure. So I dressed 60 of them. We had Nick Clay on a horse with the Lancelot armour, which was then complete. And we were up on a bank at the studios looking down on this army of knights. And this was the first time I'd really used aluminium. And John said, uh, can you all just walk around? So they're all walking around, and like, great, and like, cool, and all right. Hmm. <laughs> and he said, can you start just trotting and running a bit? You know, like, D -d 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 -d. Okay, fine. He said, could you start crashing into each other? So they all start bash, bash. That's when the dent started happening, yeah. and, bit, and bits started falling off. And I thought, <laughs> oh my God, what have I done? I thought, this is not going to last six months, it's not going to last two weeks. But it did, and it does. And it, I've never used anything else since. When you were working on Excalibur originally, were you here in Cornwall? No, I was in London, then. Oh, okay. or just outside London, Essex. Actually, my first workshop was the, the original stable uh, for Pergo Palace, which was the Queen Elizabeth I's hunting lodge. Oh. And it dated back to 15... 40, I think, something like that. that was your shop. That was my first um, That's a lovely, armory. a lovely yeah. bit of lineage to be yeah. making an ancient armor. Yeah, and and so the, sometimes things just meant to be. I don't know. Things come to me. It's weird, you know. It just, um, yeah, good things come. It's great. <laughs> things that are meant to be. Are you still learning about how to make armor? You've been doing it for 50 years. Well, do you feel like there's 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 still challenges and still uh, complications that? Not really. Yeah. Um, I think I've more or less covered it pretty much everything. I mean, I know how to move metal. I was saying about, you know, from a flat sheet, you, yeah. make, you make a shape. And I said it's about much about shrinking as it is stretching the metal. Um, but also, you, you often find when you make, especially visors, and, and like Excalibur with the big brows and the horns and the mm -hmm. teeth and stuff. When, you, when you're making stuff like that, a lot of the time, the metal actually does it for you. So although you, you can whack a big dent in it, making armour is really, people say, oh, how do you make armour? I say, well, it's just a load of dents. And that's where you, <laughs> you just put a load of dents in. It's where you put the dent. <laughs> you know, so, that's um, Jamie that's Heineman what, used to say yeah, that we, so, as model makers, we take large things and make them smaller in precise ways. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's similar. Uh, yeah. The other thing that I'm going to get to 
Well, it's good that we talk about medieval armour, but yeah. I also get a great thrill out of um, doing stuff which is really futuristic. I recognize this. This is from... That's Alien 3. Alien 3, that's right! Yeah. I have pictures of this in my Alien yeah. reference folder. Yeah, it's getting a bit damaged now, but... Um, but stuff like that, you know, I did the all the alien arms for the colonial marines for aliens. Yeah. <coughs> Bill Paxson, God bless him. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I really enjoy doing this stuff because, again, it makes it brings the allows me to use my artistic design and skills. And so you're doing all these designs and yeah. sketches to yeah, show exactly. the show, yeah. show the art director, person, yeah. designer, the yeah. director. It's like Mr. Freeze, you know. I, did, I had the pleasure of working, working with Arnie. Insisted I called him Arnie, <laughs> Mr. Schwarzenegger. Um, <laughs> if you see this. Good on you, mate. Um, yeah, we, we became quite good buddies, and uh, I made the complete freeze for him. And I was out in Hollywood for six months on that. Um, it was a nightmare because I made four of them. Wow. For the stuntmen and. And things. right, so when you're making armor like that for Mr. Freeze, you're not just making a suit for Arnold. You have to make it for a stuntman, for yeah. stand-ins and yeah. backups, right? Mm, yeah. Mm. That's a lot of a, a lot of work, and so seeing yeah. it on film, it's. It's not just about sketching it. It's not just about making it. It doesn't come into its own for you until it's been used for its purpose. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. You don't really see it. Uh, as I say, you're so busy making it and, and, you're, and you're seeing bits as you make it. But it's not when you actually see it on the actor or artist for real and you yeah. see it moving. And of course the glory is when you see the film, when you actually see it the finished result. Mm -hmm. and, it, and then again, it takes me probably four, three, four times watching a film before I can appreciate it as a film. Right, right, because like you just Excalibur. keep seeing your work. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking and thinking, oh, I could have done that better, or that could have been, <laughs> or I'm hiding behind that rock when that shot was taken. <laughs> <laughs> so you're never really relaxed enough to see the film for, for what it is yeah. until about four or five times, and then you can look at it and think, yeah, it ain't bad, you know, hopefully. <laughs> totally makes sense. Mm. I am, and uh, I see you've got the action figure. Yeah, I got that the other day in London. Does does it? Is it? It looks like they did a yeah. pretty good job. They, yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah, pretty good. Um, now I am hoping. That was, um, go ahead. Again, that was that came about um, with um, was it David Fincher, wasn't it? Uh -huh. And they called me up to the studio at Pinewood where they were shooting, and I made a, a helmet with a di totally different visor on it. And he didn't like it, and I, I'm, I didn't either. But um, so I had a discussion with him. I said, "Well, give me a clue. What do you want?" And he said, "I'm, I'm kind of looking at almost um, gladiator." As soon as he said that, I got my sketch pad out and I just drew it in front of him. Right. So it was like at half sort of gladiator type right, right. look, but they're all armoured heavy on one side, but not on the other. Same as Excalibur. Yeah. Um, and I literally drew it in front of him. and He said, "That's it. I want it." And then went away and made them. But. Um, I think I did eight of those. I think you see three in the film. If you blink, you miss them, don't you? <laughs> now I am. I've come here hoping that you would bestow upon me some of your some of your incredible knowledge uh, in the making of armor. Hmm. When I was fourteen, I went and saw Excalibur with my dad. When I was fifteen, we made a suit of armor for me together out of roofing aluminum, which is like O two or O one O, really thin stuff pop riveted together and I i mean it was fully articulated, a full harness uh, with buckles that I'd salvaged off of luggage. I hope you got photos after them. And I, there, not a single photo <laughs> oh, exists. No. I wore it to class, I wore it to school on Halloween and uh, passed out of heat exhaustion in math class and when I woke up they had cut the armor off of me and they had stored it in the art room and then school ended a couple of weeks later and over the summer they threw it out. Oh, yeah. So I only ever wore it the one time and I have no pictures of it, but it starts again, like I said, I have for my whole life been obsessed with Excalibur armor. Well, what I can say is I hope the one I make you is gonna be as good. <laughs> Your dear old dad. For... <laughs> Shall we head to the shop? Why not? This is where it kind of all happens. Oh my god. Yeah, it's a bit of a junk room. But. <laughs> no, are you kidding? There's armor yeah. in every corner. I'm in heaven. <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah, well, Patrick Stewart looking at you there. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm overwhelmed. But you know, one of the things we, um, we spoke about was the armor mm -hmm. and different stuff and aspects. But it's also uh, more important for me is making armor to measure. Okay. I deal with animals and I make horse armor. 
Really? Uh, more important then, because the horses can't talk to you. Right, so right, you right. Really be, they have to be very yeah, comfortable. Yeah, and that's a, I think that was made for Harry Potter. Oh. And that's the, the chanfron that goes over the horse's head. Wow. Yeah. It's so lovely. Oh, and padding to protect the horse. Yeah. yeah. Can you, I mean, obviously, you know, a horse is going to have armor on his head and on his back, but a human, there are some main components that make up all armor. Can, can we do an anatomy, anatomy 101 of a suit of armor? Yeah, basically, it's, um, it is what it is. It's, just, it's really a metal suit mm -hmm. that fits you as, obviously, as comfortable as possible. Right. And unrestricted movement. So, uh, basically, when you make an armor, um, you have the, the breast and back plate, which right. is made to obviously fit, so yeah. you don't dig in your neck, you don't do that. And the arms are much about the same. They, they just work on leather, so you can literally move unrestricted. <laughs> now I just did some, I did some studying. This is the pauldron. Yep. The elbow cop. You got it. The greave. No. Or oh, is that part of the gauntlet? No, that's, uh, that's called the uh, van brace. Oh, van brace, right. And that one's called the rear brace. Okay. Then you've got a gauntlet. And these are the greaves. They're the greaves, yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, we've tried a tacit. Tacit. Mm. He doesn't have a placard. On this one? On, on that one, no. Okay. It's mostly earlier armors. The uh, more 14th and 15th se uh, century armors had placate, like the Gothic arms. The later ones with one, one piece. And we've got the, the chain mail inside here. Yeah. And this beautiful helmet. Oh, and this is all aluminum. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We do exactly the same thing as steel. Well, I've made them in steel, brass, yeah. copper. I can do it in any. It's just, uh, yeah. And almost all types of armor are going to have roughly the same, the same components putting it together yeah, or in much, different yeah. combinations. Yeah, um, it's a kind of just leeway depending on design aspect more than anything. But the actual plates are what they are, you know, just to cover the body, a metal suit, basically. And it depends on what shape you put into those. Those, um, and this was this was uh, for Harry Potter as well. Uh, the breast and back plate, uh, yeah, that suit was the headless knight. Again, like filming, they spent so much money on this, and I did so much time putting all this work into it. But on the actual film, you see him gallop out of a painting. It's like <laughs> you, you think you miss it, you know? It's like. Is there a part of a, a suit that is that is the most difficult part to to make work right? Uh, apart from the helmet, which is pretty... The helmet? Pretty ongoing. Oh, yeah. Um, you have to get that dead right. But the, the most difficult part is the greave. The, 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 the calves because down it, to the ankles. How much, come? There's a, well, there's a hell of a lot more shrinking in that. And when you're shrinking metal down, you've got to keep working it side to side. You keep pulling it in, pulling it in. until Because you get all creases and things, and you bang the creases out, and then you do it again. Then you, so eventually, it, it makes it concave. You get that lovely shape. But they are the hardest things to make, especially in steel. So I understand that when you hit a piece of metal with a hammer, the metal expands, it, it, yeah. it moves. But I don't understand yeah, how you really. make metal shrink by hitting it with a hammer. How does that work? Well, it's rather hard to explain it, really. But it should usually be hand, and that's a flat sheet. Yeah. And then you want to make it round, like a greave, that yeah. comes around. But then you have to beat it here. And it, what happens is it, it kind of buckles up and then you gently hammer the buckles out and it's got to go somewhere so it, so it goes thick. Oh. So the metal actually becomes thicker when you're shrinking it. It's like when you take a helmet down in one piece, which is what they used to do. Yeah. It actually becomes thicker at the top than it is at the sides. When you beat, try and beat it out with one piece, it's almost impossible because what happens is you go so far, metal becomes so thin, yeah. that it just splits and it's not going to protect your head. Wow. So helmets were shrunk down. Yeah. Did you have a specific actor you were working with when you were designing this, or you just had measurements of? It was. I did actually meet the. Um, it wasn't an actor. It was a stuntman. Oh, okay. Yeah, one of the stuntmen, one of the Powell brothers, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, I worked with all the family, the long family of stuntmen, um, Greg Powell and ah. those guys. Yeah. Now I just touched this uh, this uh, chainmail, <clears throat> and I feel like I recognize this. <laughs> well, th that was actually came from the film Sucker Punch. Oh, okay. Which I thought it was a brilliant movie. For some reason, it never seemed to make the grade, but I don't know, it was a great film. And I finished up all the chain mail off of it. Uh, sorry, I'll correct myself. Mail off of it. <laughs> I've got to explain that. Chain mail is not the right term. No, it was never called chain mail. That came about kind of uh, late Victorian times. 
where because it looked like chain, they associated it chain mail. But originally it was always just called a coat of mail. Oh, okay. So it was called mail, not chain mail. Yeah. I will not make that mistake again. Yeah. I still do, funny enough. <laughs> Only because it's what people expect to hear. Right, of course, but of it's course. It's actually mail. Um, I'm looking at this and it looks like there's well over a hundred separate pieces oh, yeah. to put this together. Yeah. Well, to, to make the articulation of it, and everything has to be worked out, there's a lot of mathematics go into it, although you don't actually use formulas as such, like mm -hmm. uh, x, y equals blah, blah, blah. Yeah. It's not that complicated. You do it all by eye, really. But um, <clears throat> it, all, all these lines have to move, so that you get this freedom of movement. So that you can move your hand but like this as the well. gap should never be very big, otherwise a saw blade or a dagger is going to go into it. Right. So it's got to work where it almost, almost all stays together. So that's where you get this curve is so important. If you get that slightly off, that don't work. The same as stepping back with this. Great, now when you design hit. something like this, do you keep the patterns? You have patterns that you work uh, off I, of as base, as base designs, perhaps? Um, I do on occasion. I mean, I don't, I've kept patterns, but invariably I just uh, start afresh every time. Really? Um, I guess I've got used to doing it so much that, yeah, I kind of just, yeah, I mean, I've got the original patterns of King Arthur, for instance, for your suit, which means I've got to make them. <laughs> <laughs> which we're going to do in a minute, yeah. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. But I've got an incredible memory for um, shapes and lines. Uh, they kind of burn my memory, so once I've done them, I mean, I've been doing this, what, 55 years? Yeah. So if you don't get good at something by then, you might as well give up. <laughs> I find that mind-bending because, I mean, these are not... Everything here is a compound curve. There are all these angles, and when you say yeah. these shapes have to match, there mm. is that's a tremendous amount of complicated engineering going on there, and it, you're doing it by. It is, yeah. I've got, I've kind of got used to it, so I don't really think about it. But when it's only when like, you say that, it, it's true, yeah. And this, you guys, you you made this here in the last few years, even though it looks like it's a couple of hundred years old. You. You, you have techniques yeah. for bringing this armor that yeah. you make new and making um, it look old. Do you know, I was working on a film, uh, was it the first night, I think, with Sean and Richard Gere, and there was a lovely guy, um, the production designer, I think it was, um, Box, what was his first name? John Box, I think it was, and he had won a string of Oscars. Lovely, lovely man. But we had this production meeting, and I was explaining the armor and distance stuff, and I said, well, it's going to be made in aluminium. And uh, straight away, John said, Oh, aluminium's a load of rubbish. He said, don't, don't photograph well, it always look rubbish, you know. I said, hang on, mate. I said, you haven't seen my stuff, have you? So he went, well, it's aluminium. I said, okay. So I went away and went to the next meeting. I, made, I had an original iron rusty breastplate yeah. with all the rust marks and pit marks in it. And I copied it exactly in aluminium. I have a technique for doing that and yeah. aged it all up and I had the two of them identical and I went and said oh John by the way I said uh, which one's steel and which one's aluminium he went yeah I said well sure that one he, went, <laughs> he couldn't believe it he said I'll take all my words back <laughs> so I could actually make aluminium look 500 years old. Terry, I'm really appreciating you letting me come into your shop and apprentice with you this week. Um, you mentioned that you had the designs for King Arthur's armor from Excalibur in your head and that's awesome because yeah. I have always wanted to a suit of King Arthur's armor. Will you, will you help me achieve this desire? I certainly will and I'll also do it in memory of Nigel Terry. Excellent. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, shall we begin?